Hi, and welcome to this week's Devo. Uh, for this week, I want to consider a verse that involves reopening the church. I know that COVID-19 is such an uncertain time. There's so much we don't know. How dangerous is it to return to church? Um, will there be a second wave? There's a lot of questions out there, but I want to look and see a little bit about what God's word might say into our situation. So I want to look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. It says this, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, when you read a verse that starts off that way, you realize it's got a lot of context to it. Not only is it the context of what happened just before this, because it's not the beginning of a sentence, but the whole context of the book in which the writer to Hebrews is writing to people who are under such severe persecution that they're considering giving up their faith. And he's writing, showing them that what they now have in Jesus is so much better than what they used to have. And he's using the Old Testament to show them how these things are just shadows of the reality that we now have in Christ. If you've never read the book of Hebrews, it's an incredible book. Take some time and go through that in your morning readings. But um, for now, I just want us to narrow in a little bit on this verse. And actually, I think we need to begin at the start of the sentence. Now, in, in Greek, run-on sentences are perfectly fine. You've never gotten away with this in English class, but uh, the writer of uh, Hebrews started his sentence in verse 19 and goes all the way through to verse 25 in one sustained and prolonged thought. And so let's start back there. We're not going to explore it too deeply, but just to get a sense of what's going on. He begins, first of all, with um, two uh, truths that he's already demonstrated, he wants to build upon. In verses 19 through 21, he says two of them. Therefore, this is verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up, opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. That's um, how we now have access to God because of our redemption in Christ. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, another amazing aspect of Christ's victory on the cross, he is our great high priest. And he's already talked about those previously. He now moves into three exhortations, three calls to action for believers based on these and other things he's already written. Verse 22 gives us the first. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so since we have been redeemed and regenerated in hearts, we can live out these commands. Let's do that. Let's, let's come to this God. Verse 23 is our next one. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't give up on our faith. Hold fast to that confession. Why? Because the one we're trusting in is worthy of our trust. He's faithful. And the last one, and this is the one that really involves our verse, and let us consider how to stir one another to love, stir up one another to love and good works. Now, the third call here is to stir up one another, to, in, to, to cause one another to do these things, to incite one another to love more and better, and to the righteous requirements that we know God asks us, good works, to get out there and live the righteousness, live out the gospel that we've been saved by. Then he says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And what are we to do? Well, we, we are to, uh, we're to um, stir one another up to love and good works. And I love that as he calls us to not neglect one another, that's just a minor point under stirring one another up. You see, many of us, when we think about going to church, we think about what we get out of it. I mean, will it feed my soul? Will it be a blessing to me? But he's saying, no, no, one of the reasons, this isn't the only one, but one of the reasons we go to church is to stir one another up, to be a blessing to each other, to be a catalyst in each other's lives that we might love better, more like our Savior, that we might live better, more like our Lord. One of the reasons we get together is because how we can be a blessing to one another. I want you to think just for a moment back in Genesis, when God created Adam, this is Genesis chapter 2, verse, thir verse 18, he said this, Then the Lord God said, it, it is not good 
that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And he goes on to make Eve, and that has a lot to teach us about marriage and God's will for, for men and women in marriage. But, but I think on a more general level, it's telling us that God didn't create us to be independent or alone. We were made as social beings. We were made to need each other. And just as he, he made women and men as fit matches in the church, we're members of a body. He made us to need each other. You are not complete in your Christian walk alone. We need the body to be that blessing, in part to stir us up to love and good works. The opposite of neglecting meeting together in our passage is um, encouraging one another. And that encouragement, I think some of us have been feeling dry spiritually. Some of us have been feeling distant. And some of that is because we are missing the gathering of the saints together. I'm longing for it. I miss you guys so much. I want to get together. And I wonder, do you have that same longing too? Church is not simply about what I get out of it. It's about the mutual blessing of saints gathered together. Now, Certainly, church is more than that. It's about honoring and worshiping the God who deserves our everything. It's about learning and growing together in our faith as with the preached word, as in the teaching of the word. It's about, it's about the, the context of, of the gospel witness that we could organize and get out. We gather together to strengthen ourselves and get out and share this gospel with the world. It's about so many things, but it is about in our passage that love that we stir up in one another that grows cold so quickly otherwise, about those good works that are so hard to live out. And yet, as we live as examples and live into each other's lives, we encourage each other in these practices. Now, I want to just close by asking a simple question. I know this is a bit longer of a devo, but this is an important one. Are we in um, defiant, sinfully ignoring the command here to not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some? It's a complicated question, a good question, one that I will try to answer simply in a way that won't satisfy everyone, I'm sure. But my short answer is no. First of all, this idea of neglecting meeting together as the idea of forsaking or abandoning, he's talking about those who will be apostatizing, they'll be turning away from the faith. They're saying, why would I bother meeting together anymore? It's too painful, it's too difficult, it's too risky for persecution in my life. I'm just going to walk away from it. And so they walk away from meeting together, abandoning with no intention. For us, it has been a pause. And we've paused for two reasons. First of all, this pause has been in obedience to the government. And now I, I believe that sometimes you must ignore government commands that are unrighteous, that call us to go against our, our conscience. But in this case, this wasn't persecution against Christians. This was wholesale. Everyone was asked to stop because of the danger involved for preservation of life, for love of uh, others. And so we want to abide by such rules and respect the authority of government because we think that they had a really good point. And the beautiful thing about following the government is either they say yes or they say no, so it's very black and white. And now with Toronto entering stage two, now for two weeks, I believe it's been, we could go ahead, couldn't we? So why aren't we? Well, there were two considerations. And the second consideration was love of neighbor. And this one is not nearly so black and white as the government. And this one is a little bit dicier. And we're much more in gray areas. See, it, it is risky. We don't want to get together and, and cause our neighbor to get the, pan, the, the disease and potentially die of it. That would be very unloving. But the question is, how risky is it? I think we all recognize, and if not, I hope we do, that there are certain individuals who are very vulnerable to COVID-19. And even when we gather together, we would not expect or encourage them to come. We're not going to police it. We're not going to stop people. But we would certainly encourage anyone who knows that they are vulnerable, in particular to this, this disease, to stay home, right? And that would be best because we don't want them to, to foolishly um, endanger themselves um, and others around them. And some of us, of course, are caring for those who are very vulnerable on a regular basis, and they may need to make decisions there too. And we leave it up to the conscience of each person. But what about general people? What about uh, someone relatively healthy? Now, um, some people would, wouldn't be comfortable coming to church until the uh, vaccine is created. 
other people are have been meeting with friends all through this pandemic. They've got they think there's no more danger than the common flu. Now, it's interesting me, to me that through this period, everyone's become an expert in uh, pandemics and COVID-19. But I, I want to say I'm just a pastor. I'm not a medical expert. I, when it comes to wisdom on how risky it is, I am not the right person to look to to formulate those answers. We have a medical advisory committee of professionals, and we're listening to their advice. And we're doing our best to choose wisdom. And the truth is we're, we're going to have a spectrum of opinions here. We want to get together. We want to get together as soon as we can. My heart yearns for that day. It couldn't come soon enough for me. And yet there is wisdom involved. And, and in the meantime, as, as we are still in this position, as painful as it is to not be together, are we yearning for that day? Because I think if that's in your heart, you're not breaking this command. If, if, if you want to get back together, but, but wisdom and love of neighbor is preventing you from the danger of the virus, then you're not breaking this command. But if you've grown cold, if you just don't care, and it's really nice to sit on your couch and it's convenient, that's a problem. That's a problem. So one of the reasons I'm, I'm giving this Devo and the next few Devos will be on similar subjects is because I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us to long and yearn for that day. I want to encourage us because when we get back together, there's going to be all kinds of restrictions. It's not going to be easy. We're going to need lots of help getting this going right. And yet I want us to see it will be worth it, brothers and sisters. It will be worth it. We are missing much in missing the gathering together. But despite the inconveniences, despite the restrictions we will be under, there's a lot of good reasons to come together. And one of them we find here. Let me just close by saying this. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. 2020 has been a crazy year. Is the day drawing near? Oh, let us not neglect meeting together, but let's stir each other up to love and good works, encouraging each other in this practice. God bless you.